Spiritism, and that's the title as well. Brother Harry? Well, there are, yeah, we'll have some rather need to shut down the videos. You're muted, Brother Harry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that better? Oh, that's yeah, We got you. All righty. Let me. Uh... Okay. I'll just share my screen here. Hold on. Share, share, share. Okay, there it is. So at the uh, the title is thoughts on spiritism thoughts on spiritism, and uh, again we're happy to be here. Appreciate the blessings of the convention, love from the Muhammad brother, especially Sister Karen and others here. Sister Karen Wildblood, and uh, there's also Sister Karen Baker. <clears throat> we have two Harrys now, Brother Harry Grable and Brother Harry Wildblood. So, but. Uh, Thoughts on spiritism. There, spiritism is a very large subject. It was, Brother Russell was extremely, uh, what should I say? He was very wary of this. He's trying to warn the brethren. This is something that had come, uh, come upon the brethren with the Lord's return. So he talked about this quite a lot. There's a large spiritism uh, booklet on that. And uh, one of the reasons why, why I wanted to do this lesson is this is kind of a hole in my understanding. I was familiar with a few areas of it, but I wanted to go into it more thoroughly. So I read a whole bunch of things on it. And uh, things have changed. Uh, uh, there have been new things, new developments since Brother Russell's day that we should be aware of. You know? and, uh, but what I, what I really want to look at is sort of take the big picture. Where did all this come from? Where is it going? What is the real... Uh, what are the real motivations of these uh, fallen spirit beings and what do we have to do to uh, make our calling election sure and not fall into these pitfalls? <clears throat> so, you know, we opened with watchfulness. It's a matter of now if you if you're watchful, if you don't know what you're watching for, uh, you know, watching doesn't do a whole lot of good, but uh, being watchful and knowledgeable and arming ourselves. Well, if we go back to the beginning, <clears throat> we talk about the beginning. In the beginning was the word, the logos, uh, Jesus in his pre-human existence. He was a God. He was with the God. And all things were made by him. So everything was made by him, including the angels, the angelic host. Now, they have staggering, compared to us, they have staggering intellectual and physical capabilities. Uh, they had been witnesses and co-workers in the creation for billions of years. So they've been with God for billions of years. They had seen the orderliness of God's creation, the genius of his design, and the creation of the universe from the subatomic, teeny weeny, up to the supergalactic, you know, the, the bigger than galaxies, the way they're structured. In Psalm 119, or well, Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. If you want to see somebody's capabilities and their competence, look at what they've done. Look at what they've done. So the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Well, they had abundant evidence of God's competence, his control, his design, his wisdom, his power. <clears throat> this should have inspired unfailing confidence in God's ability to work out his own will for the blessing of all. After all, the angels had all been blessed in, in watching this. Well, with the creation of man, this was the ultimate physical creation, physical creation in this three-dimensional universe we, li we live in. Psalm 8, 5, for thou hast made him, made man, a little lower than the angels, and has crowned him with glory and honor. Now, that the I, I really love the this uh, statement, is spiritual and human nature separate and distinct on page 201 of the first volume. Where he says the character of the mental operations of each, in other words, the spiritual and human, is the same. That's an amazing thing. They work the same way. 
<clears throat> with the same data, the same information for reasoning and, and under similar conditions, these different natures are able to arrive at the same conclusions. Wow, same conclusions. This is absolutely necessary for God to, to reason with them. You know, God's intelligent creation, they all have reason, they have memory, they have a free will, so they can make decisions. You know, God didn't make a bunch of robots and program them to do something. He gave them the capacity to reason, to learn, to remember, and to make decisions. And they have a moral sense, uh, with a moral sense. And because of all this, God can say to mankind, come, let us reason together. Come, let us reason together. Could say that to perfect man. He can also say that to fallen man. We know from Isaiah 1, 18, this is said much after the fall. Well, there had never been, uh, in, up in the first two years, there had never been any discord, any disharmony, or any failure, supposed failure, in the outworking of God's will. <clears throat> until Genesis chapter 3. That's Genesis chapter 3 is the day of the fall. Well, with ambition, pride, and sin, they were in Lucifer's heart. They were inside. <clears throat> well, God knew this. Well, Isaiah 14, 13, this was speaking for Lucifer. For thou hast said in thine heart, I, notice I, 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 I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the size of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high God. I, 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 I. This is not selflessness. This is selfishness in the extreme, in the absolute. Well, Lucifer's plan was to separate the perfect man from God, to show Lucifer's superior superiority over God and to be worshipped above God. That's what he wanted. <clears throat> so he presented Eve. He went to the weakest of the human creation. He presented Eve with accusations against God's motives and character and then presented her with a tempting proposition to gain knowledge, something highly to be desired, with no effort. Gain knowledge, gain wisdom with no effort at all. That's always the ploy of the adversary. You want something? Here it is. Do it the easy way. It won't take you any effort. You do it. You're alienated from God. You feel dirty. And now what you wanted, you don't value anymore. And Satan walks away laughing. That's what he always does. So this is what the temptations always are. <clears throat> well, Eve had no direct experience with God or with lies, or with deceit. Those things didn't exist. She succumbed to this temptation. Adam followed, and now it seemed, it seemed that God's wonderful plan had been foiled by the simple ploy of Lucifer, who's now known as Satan. Lucifer, <clears throat> this was meant light. In fact, there's, a, there's an enzyme called luciferase. It's a enzyme in fireflies that gives off light. So Lucifer was a wonderful, beautiful angel, but after this, known as Satan. <clears throat> well, God had revealed himself only by the outworking of his plan, but not by the plan itself. In other words, he didn't lay out his plan and say to the angelic host, here's everything I'm going to do. Revelation 5.1 uh, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, the book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals, but it was still in his hand. He's not opening it up for anybody. <clears throat> He's saying, look at what I'm doing. You should have confidence in me by everything I've done for these billions and billions of years. But this perceived failure by God to preserve his human creation along with his death sentence on humanity, this was a conceptual challenge to the angelic creation. <clears throat> was God just saying, let's scrap this whole thing. That didn't work out. Is that what was happening? Well, after all, no angel had ever died. Lucifer hadn't been condemned to death, even though this, this deflection. <clears throat> so what had happened? Could this situation be corrected? And if so, who would correct it and how? How's this going to get, get fixed? 
And most important, did this shake the angel's confidence in God? I think for some, the answer is yes. Would they trust God? Say, well, just sit back. It's all going to be okay. God's got this. Look at everything he's done. He's got this. We don't have to, we don't have to, you know, grab the steering wheel, stick our hand into things. Or would they take matters into their own hands? Would they lean to their own understanding? <clears throat> well, Paul tells us that in Hebrews 2, 5, for unto the angels hath he not put into subjection the world to come. And through a discussion, if you look at that scripture, you'll see the discussion of that. The inference is, is the world that was, the world before the flood, was under the ministration of angels. <clears throat> okay, and unlike angels, unlike the angels, mankind had the capacity to procreate and to reproduce. This is something angels could not do. So this was an intriguing opportunity to some of the angels. They looked at that and said, hmm, I wonder what we can do with this. They may have thought, well, some new blood could possibly correct the dying condition of mankind. After all, no angel had ever died. So they could materialize for this purpose of procreation. In Genesis 6, 2, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair. In other words, they had a desire for them. And they took them wives of all which they chose. It sounds like the women didn't have much choice in this. They, the, these fallen angels just said, I'm taking you. <clears throat> and when they materialized as humans, even with their superior intelligence, it seems that they were likely subject to the same passions as other humans. In other words, if you're going to become human, the various capacities and things that human experience, you're going to experience it yourself. <clears throat> well, in Genesis 6, 4, there were Nephilim. This is translated as giants, but this there are. Uh, in some translations, but there's Nephilim in the earth in those days. And also, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, that tells me that they're, they're taking a human form, and they bore children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Well, this was a very powerful, intelligent, destructive hybrid race that was completely unauthorized in God's plan. Now, maybe these angels began with a desire to help. How are we going to help fix this situation? But this, mixed with a lack of confidence in, in God and the carnal desire for the daughters of men, led them in a sinful direction. They now had their own children. They had their own offspring. And now, in a way, they were like God in bringing forth life by doing their own will. That's what God had done. He brought forth life. Say, so here we want to have life on these various planes. Now the, these fallen angels are doing this. So whatever their intent for uh, in bringing forth their Nephilim offspring, God put an end to it. God's response to this in Genesis 6, 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Man the Nephilim, <clears throat> the fallen angels, all these terrible influences on them, their alienation from God. He says, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I've made them. Now, he wasn't changing his mind. He said, yeah, I wish I hadn't made mankind. But he's going to start with a clean slate. God would preserve the pure strain of humanity. So in Genesis 6, 9, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. He was uncontaminated by the fallen angels. He had a perfect heart toward God. He, he walked with God. Noah's faith was manifested in building the ark in obedience to God's covenant and instructions. He was trying to do God's will to the best of his ability. Well, the result of the flood is this playground of the angels. You know, all humanity, the women, Nephilim, everything, it's all destroyed. Only eight humans lived through the flood, Noah and his family. All the fallen angels were still alive, but all their children had been destroyed through the, through the flood. 
Now, if somebody had destroyed your children in some act, what would you think about it? Would you love that person? Would you say, oh, gee, I guess I did the wrong thing. Well, some who saw the correct principles may have said that, and likely did, but others would be very, very upset by this. God's punishment of the fallen angels in Jude 1.6, the angels which kept not their first estate. In other words, they did not remain in the heavenly realms, but they materialized. They got involved with man and sin and carnality and sensuality and <clears throat> etc. They left their own habitation. He's reserved in everlasting chains. These are, this is really a picture of supernatural restraints unto darkness, unto or until the judgment of the great day. For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell. Now, this is not the grave. This is Tartarus or Tartaru, at Earth's atmosphere. In other words, they're being constrained in this dark place, uh, limited contact. <clears throat> uh, and so they've been delivered uh, into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. This meant no more materializations. They're not going to do this with mankind anymore. So now what? They've been, they've been restrained. They've been punished. They've been shown they've done the wrong thing. Now what? Whose example are they going to follow? Are they going to follow Satan's or God and the holy angels? So they have an opportunity to make a decision. Well, the vindictive ones would follow Satan, the usurper, the prince of this world, also called the prince of devils or prince of demons. And these fallen angels following Satan, they had no further interest in rescuing mankind. They're not going to do that anymore. Now what they want, because they're vindictive, they want to get back at mankind. They want to get back at God himself. They're going to manipulate and alienate mankind from God and God's truths and God's law and God's principles of righteousness. Well, enter Nimrod. Nimrod was Ham's grandson. Uh, Ham, Ham's son was Cush. He begot Nimrod and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. In the beginning of, king, of his kingdom was Babel and other cities in the land of Shinar. Now, the idea of mighty hunter before the Lord, what does that mean? Well, it means that he trusted in his own strength as a hunter and protector rather than having any faith in God's power. And many, many followed Nimrod. After all, you can't see God. They could see Nimrod. They could see what he was doing. And Josephus says in confirmation of this, the multitude were very ready to follow the determination of, of Nimrod and to esteem it a piece of cowardice to submit to God. That's in antiquities, uh, in his antiquities. Well, Nimrod uh, was the, both the son and the husband of Semiramis, you know, strange relationships there who together began a gr the great false religion promising life after death along with carnal pleasures. After all, man's life had been curtailed. It was hundreds and hundreds of years before the flood. Now it's down to 120 years. So what does man want? They want life. <clears throat> they would like to have life and they would like to have pleasure. They, the selfishness, they're saying, what do I get for me? Well, this religion now offers that life after death, carnal pleasures now, do it now. Carnal pleasures now, life after death later. Well, in the Edgar's Faith Foundations mythology in the Bible, I recommend this. It's hard to read because there's so many reprehensible things. But uh, in the Edgar's mention, they've, they've done a tremendous scholarly work in looking up uh, references from antiquity, etc. He said, uh, Nimrod led men into sensuality, teaching them that they might enjoy the pleasures of sin without fear of retribution from a holy God. In other words, they have faith in Nimrod, have faith in this new religion that they were making. Well, Nimrod was killed in a violent death. Now, Semiramis, his mother slash wife, she then teaches that Nimrod had been resurrected and was alive again, that Nimrod was the promised seed of the woman, 
So there's a usurpation of these basic biblical uh, doctrines that they were somewhat aware of, Genesis 3.15. This is probably a suggestion of the fathers of father of lies, what he told Eve, ye shall not surely die. In other words, you can't die. Well, if you see a body fall over, the animation is gone, and you say, oh, they're not really dead. They're still alive. It's just in a state you can't see. Who's going to come back? Who's going to, who can say that's not true? So this was a lie. You couldn't really prove it as a lie, only if you paid attention to the scriptures themselves, to the lessons of God. Well, this was the origin of the most ancient apostate mother son, Semiramis and her son, mother son, life after death religion. And with this new belief and fearing another flood, because they're getting away from God, they know what God did, did before when wickedness was prolific, <clears throat> they, so they start a building project. In Genesis 11, 4, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. In other words, it's going to be above, above the waters. If there are waters to come, we're going to build some higher so waters can't get us. And let us make us a name. Let us be scattered, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So they're looking for protection. So God uh, says, let us go down and confound their language. In other words, it's going to make them all have different languages, their communication. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. So what's the result of this? Well, the Tower of Babel, Babel didn't get built, didn't get completed. But, but <clears throat> because of this false religion that was with them, they carried their new beliefs to all the corners of the earth. And if you look at the religions around the world, in antiquity or even today, you've got Greece, uh, the Ceres, the Ceres, the great mother with a babe at her breast. There's a Madonna and child. In Rome, pagan Rome, it was Fortuna and the boy Jupiter. India, Isi and Isawara. Egypt, Isis and Osiris. And these things are found all over the place. Now, how could this be a coincidence? They all come up with the same thing. Well, they all started in the same place. The Bible says, here's exactly how this happened. <clears throat> well, in Tibet and China and Japan, there were missionaries who were astonished to find the exact counter counterpart of Madonna and her child as devoutly represent, rep, uh, reverence in papal Rome itself. What a coincidence. But they didn't make the conclusion, gee whiz, I, get, I guess the papacy got this from paganism too. But this is where it came from, the most ancient of all these uh, false religions. So Nimrod and Semiramis are known by many names. If you look in Jeremiah, Jeremiah is a very long chapter, very long book, which talks about paganism, all this, uh, all this paganism, uh, spiritism, all these things are linked together. Uh, we have Tammuz, Baal, uh, Molech, uh, et cetera. All of these are all names for Nimrod. These are all names, different names. Uh, if you look at Astarte, Diana of the Ephesians, the Queen of Heaven, these are all names for the Semiramis. They're all names of exactly the same thing. And Paul tells us about this history. He says, because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they, thank were they thankful. And in their vain imaginations, their foolish heart was darkened. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God to the image made unto corruptible man. And, excuse me, birds and four-footed beasts. In other words, they created God and man's image instead of uh, creating man and God's image. They made man, uh, they made their conceptions of God with the passions, the selfish passions of fallen man. Now, where did they get those ideas? <clears throat> they got it from spiritism. They got it from this false religion. And they gave up the true idea of God, the true idea of the true God, who changed the truth of God into a lie and wor wor worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. Well, now these life after, you know, go back to these fallen angels. How can we mess with mankind? How can we do damage? 
Well, these life after death religions provided very fertile opportunities for the fallen angels to continue their rebellion against God by enticing mankind further into these doctrines of devils. You know, if we have this life after death religion, let's give them evidence of it. Let's give them evidence of this life after death. And if you go down centuries from this, even Socrates and Plato's, these great thinkers who base things on, gee whiz, I reasoned it out myself. I didn't look at any evidence. I just, you know, philosophized this. They were teaching the doctrine of immortality of the soul. Look how wonderful man is. It can't be that when you die, you're just gone. There's got to be something that lives on. That was what they wanted. And that was the, what the adversary, <clears throat> the fallen angels, and these false doctrines gave them. But others, the holy angels, and some of mankind maintained their confidence in God. The holy angels are still sitting there saying, you know, God's got this. Things are looking bad, but God's got this. We have, we have confidence in him. We're not going to give up our confidence in him. We trust him. Look at what he's done for billions of years. We know he's got this. And the faithful ones of mankind also demonstrated this. Look at what Job said. Job 14, 13 and, uh, four, 13 and 14. Oh, that thou would hide me in the grave till thy wrath be passed. Now he's, this is the grave, Sheol, oblivion, death. Here's what he's saying. Until thy wrath be passed. All thy days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. What is he actually saying? Job spoke of death and Sheol, not life after death, life after resurrection, life after God's wrath is passed. He knows he's going to be in death and he's going to wait. But Job knows God's got a way to fix this. Here's God. He is the creator of all things. He is the source of all knowledge and wisdom and power. <clears throat> he has a way to fix this. I have confidence in that. He's got this. I'm just going to wait for his solution to be manifested to me in due time. Even if I go into the grave, it's not, I'm not going to lose confidence in God. Just as, his, his, as he said to his wife, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So some had this trust in God. Others, unfortunately, had forsaken their confidence in God. Well, Job knew that this catastrophe of sin would work out as a blessing to mankind. You know, this permission of evil, as we later learned, this was a wonderful blessing. It was needed by mankind. But the fallen angels would promote this idea of life after death by personating the dead. They would become, they would communicate with mankind through mediums. We're going to talk about mediums in a little bit. Mediums and necromancers. What's a necromancer? Well, necro means death, means dead. But so what it is, is folks who are communicating with the dead. That's what they're saying they're doing. Mediums and necromancers. Now, this would give almost irresistible evidence of life after death. I mean, if you can actually talk to the dead, if you think you're talking to the dead, my word, you would think there's life after death. Well, most of mankind flowed along in this direction. They just went with the flow. They just started flowing downstream. You know, you got paganism everywhere. You've got this false religion spread all throughout the earth. <clears throat> They've got this Madonna child, life after death, resurrection, immortality, of soul kind of thing everywhere, everywhere. But this provided a way to identify who those who wanted to think for themselves. If the whole world's going one direction, but you're going to think for yourself and you're going to go the other direction, what's going to happen? You're going to make waves. You're going to make waves. There's going to be turbulence. You're going to, be, you're going to have to swim against the stream, just like Abraham did. Abraham followed the one true God. He left his home, his, his house, house of his father, and his pagan surroundings. There was no solutions for him there. Well, later in the dealings with Israel, when the law was given, God gave this law to keep Israel separate from the pagan religions, from the fallen angels, from these, from the necromancers, from all these things that were pushing the rest of the world into, into the wrong direction, to teach them 
righteousness and to prepare them eventually to be the bride of Christ. Again, in, in uh, Exodus chapter 4, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. I'm preparing my firstborn for the greatest the greatest thing, the greatest inheritance a father could possibly give, and that's to eventually, over the centuries, prepare them to be the bride of Christ when his son would be on the scene. So the idea was to keep separate from the idolatrous people of the land and their pagan religions, most of which involved spiritism in some form because this enforced these false religions. <clears throat> if we look at the law, uh, Leviticus 27, there are many, many features of the law that uh, talk about this, but it says, a man or a woman who is a medium or a necromancer shall certainly be put, put to death. So the ones who are, who are facilitating this communication with these evil angels, these fallen, these lying spirits, they have to be put to death. But it also says, if a person turns to mediums and necromancers, goes a whoring after him, I will cut him off amongst the people. In other words, they'll be put to death too. So if you're the necro if you're the medium or the one that goes to the medium, you're both doing uh, going against God's laws. We're going to get rid of you. We're going to put you to death. Well, here the law, it's very, very clear. But after God had forsaken Saul, this is centuries later, Saul was now desperate. And this is what the fallen angels want. They want folks who are desperate. They're desperate. Saul was desperate. He sought other means of information. He feel he's in a bind. The Philistines are about to attack. What to do? He's desperate. So in 1 Saul 28.3, now Samuel had died. So Samuel, the one he would go to, the one he'd rely on, Samuel's dead. And Saul had followed the God, God's laws, and he put the mediums and necromancers out of the land. They were in the land. They were everywhere. He says, we're going to get rid of them. Then Saul said to his servants, uh, seek out uh, a woman who's a medium and inquire of her. So he knew they were still around. He knew they were still around. And the woman, so if they find one, the woman says, who shall I bring up for you? I mean, which of the dead would you like to talk to? He says, well, bring up Samuel. Samuel's my... You know, he's my mentor. He gives me advice. Well, then Samuel, now this is the spirit being the fallen spirit who's in, impersonating Samuel. Samuel's in the grave. He doesn't exist. He's in Sheol. <clears throat> like Job, he's waiting for the resurrection. But because Saul is so desperate, now this, this fallen lying angel can now trick Saul. He says, so he continues the conversation. Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul says, I'm in great distress for the Philistines are warring against me and God has turned away from me and answers me no more, you know, either by prophets or dreams. So tell me, tell me, what shall I do? Well, the lion, when somebody's desperate real like this, really wants something, that lying spirit is thinking, Saul, I've got you now. I've got you now. You're desperate. And that's what they want. They want people to be desperate or curious or whatever they can do in order to enter into their lives and influence them. The spirit knew that Saul's army was outmatched. I mean, the, the spirit beings, they can see over the entire earth. It's like they're on a tall tower and they can see much, much farther than mankind can. They knew that Saul's army's outmatched and God was not fighting for him. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen? He's going to be defeated. So he says to him, moreover, the Lord will give Israel also in, uh, with you into the hand of the Philistines. Tomorrow you and your son shall be with me. In other words, you're going to be in the grave. You're going to be dead. You're going to be, you know, life after death is what he's saying. Of course, did they really know the future? Well, no, they didn't. In fact, what they told him was a lie. It was not true because some of Saul's sons lived. Not everybody was killed. They were just looking at, you know, the size of the armies, what's going to happen? Well, Saul and many of his family are, are going to die. Well, according to uh, Isaiah 41, 21, I really like this, the God test. Uh, Set forth your case, says the Lord. Bring your proofs. Tell us what is to come hereafter that we may know that ye are gods. Well, if you can't do that, you know that they're not gods. Well, these were not gods. These were 
not the dead. They didn't have superior wisdom. They're just taking their best guess and they're tricking. These were impersonators. They were lying spirits. And how did God know that he could ask for a necromancer? Because they were all around in Canaan and many believed in them, despite the loss of God and the lessons that the dead were really dead. They were still everywhere. God through Isaiah, I love this, he says, uh, 819, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? I mean, even if you could talk to the dead, even if you could, why would you consult with God who knows everything? The dead, what do they know? In fact, they don't even exist. So, I mean, the logic here is so beautiful. But there were these forbidden pagan influences. Now, when we take a look at uh, Deuteronomy, this is uh, Moses talking to Israel right before they go into the promised land. He says, when the Lord thy God shall bring you into the land, whither thou goest, <clears throat> and cast out many nations before these. Here's who I'm going to get rid of. The Hittites, the Girgashites, the, and, and you have to get rid of them as well. The Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Seven nations greater than mightier. You're going to smite them. You're going to utterly destroy them and kill man, woman, ox, ass. I mean, no evidence of make no covenant them and show them no mercy. Why? Because of the influence of the pagan rites and the demonism. They had these pagan rites, they had demonism, spiritism. They had these very powerful proofs of life after death and all this other crazy stuff. God says, I want you to have nothing to do with that. So you've got to destroy all of them totally. <clears throat> In Deuteronomy 18.10, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who uses divination, or who practices witchcraft, or interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritist, or who calls up the dead. Now notice, make their children pass through the fire, medium, spiritist, sorceress, uh, necromancers, Spiritism and child torture and sacrifice were found together. They were linked. I mean, they were linked like this. They're going to find that everywhere. Well, Solomon ignored these laws. Solomon, here's later. Here's the after, uh, you know, here's uh, David's son. <clears throat> First Kings 11, 7. Then did Solomon build a high place for, for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab in the hill that's before Jerusalem. And for Molech, we know who Molech is the abomination of the children of Ammon. What were they thinking? Well, Solomon built temples for his 700 wives, most of whom were idolatrous. There's, where the, there's, there's one of the big problems. Later, this is centuries later, King Manasseh, he was the son of Hezekiah, a really good king, but when he went exactly the opposite direction. What was he doing? Manasseh did what was evil in the sight of the Lord according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. So if you want to see what were they doing, look at what Molech's doing. Here's what the people did, those seven tribes we just talked about. Manasseh burned his son as an offering, burned his own child in the fire as an offering to Molech, and used fortune telling and omens and dealt with mediums and with necromancers. It's all linked together. Brethren, once a people are desperate, if they have no faith and they have no hope and think that some unseen malevolent force has control over them, they will do anything through fear, even torture their own children to death for Molech or Baal or whatever. Now, perhaps the evil angels thought, well, after all, Abraham, God told Abraham <clears throat> to kill and burn Isaac, didn't he? And God killed our children, the Nephilim in the flood. So we'll get these worthless humans to kill their own children. I mean, who knows what the logic of the fallen angels is? But look at these reprehensible things they're doing. So when we take a look at it, mediums and possession, uh, in Jesus' day, there was possession. Ones were actually possessed completely by these fallen, uh, fallen angels. 
But we want to ask, what is a medium? Well, the word medium, it means it's a means through which an expression is made. You know, artists use media. You know, TV, that's a media. Radio, that's a media. In other words, an expression, communication is done through that medium. But a medium, a person, a human being, the medium must first give themselves over to the control of that spirit. They must welcome the spirit to communicate through them. In other words, take me. That's kind of what they're saying. Just take me. Possession happens when the control of the person's mind and body becomes absolute and their own identity is destroyed. And I like to show you what I mean. When we look at medium, now here's a, here's a Bianco Carrera marble. It's a beautiful hard marble. It's used by artists. But here's the medium. Here's the marble itself. And here's what the artist is doing with it. Now, this is Michelangelo. It's a Pieta, one of the most famous and most amazing sculptures in the world. But when you look at it, what do you see? You see Mary, you see Jesus, you see the flesh, you see the blood vessels, you see the, the, the clothing, the folds uh, in the clothes. But do you see the marble? Not really. I mean, the whole idea, and this is a proper idea, Michelangelo expressing this idea, but he's using the medium of the marble. Or if you look at oil paint, here's the medium of the oil paint. You can buy a, buy a bunch of these. Here's the oil paint <clears throat> squirting out. There's the medium itself, but what can be done with it? Well, here's Britain Revere's Daniel. Here's what he's done with it. So when you use this, you don't say, oh, look, I see oil paint here. No, you see Daniel in the lion's den. That's what you say. It's conveying that in such a realistic manner you hardly see the medium of expression at all. You see what is being expressed. <clears throat> so when a person wants to turn themselves into a medium, here's what's really happening. <clears throat> this is like the puppeteer is the spirit being controlling the puppet completely. In other words, here's the spirit, spirit being, here's the puppet. Do you want to turn yourself into a puppet? Should anybody of mankind want to turn themselves into a puppet? <clears throat> either as a medium or through possession, because here's what the fallen angels want. They want control. The fallen angels want to control the medium. They want to control those who are possessed like marionettes. So the fallen angels will destroy the identity of the in individual and express themselves using that individual for their own selfish, evil purposes. <clears throat> Because the fallen angels lost the power to materialize, they want the carnality, the sensuality, the pleasures of humanity as close as they can get. <clears throat> they look for people who are unsatisfied, who are curious, who are desperate and searching and willing to compromise their wills to lower their resistance and invite the spirit to take control. They're looking for somebody to put out the welcome mat, to give them an in invitation. They work through friends, through churches, through self-help groups, any way they can get a foothold. You know, oh, go to this hypnotist, learn how to, uh, you know, stop smoking. They offer answers, but what they give is lies, deceit, betrayal, destruction for their own amusement. They offer the deep answers, the deeper truths and special powers beyond the scriptures. Oh, the scriptures is okay as a start, but we really want to know, listen to what we have to tell you beyond the scriptures. They talk of spiritual gifts, speaking in tongues and heal, miraculous healings, but these are all deceptions and lies. In fact, a deep, deeply religious friend of mine, she was in the so-called church, we're speaking in tongues, you know, it's like we're a Pentecostal church. Speaking in tongues was promoted. And she told me that she had spoken in tongues on several occasions. And this was a mark of, you know, you're a really good Christian if you've spoken in tongues. So I asked what more have you learned about the word of God through this? She thought, she said, nothing. So I asked, who would want you to spend all this time and focus and energy thinking that you're pleasing God, but getting nothing at all out of it? Who would want that? Who would want that? Would God want that for you? She realized the source of this and she never did it again. Well, spiritism comes in many forms. Ancestor worship, spirit guides, I mean, Indians, American Indians, other, other, other Aboriginal cultures. 
<clears throat> they they uh, been have spirit guides, spiritism involved in there. The Indian fakers, they're doing the undoable. How is it possible they can walk on these hot coals and not be, be charred? Because they're doing the undoable with the power of spiritism. Stigmata, the bleeding from hands and feet. People get all excited about that. How could this happen? Let's go spiritism. Seances. If you read the spiritism booklet or you look at the uh, articles on spiritism Brother Russell has written, yes, there are many fakes, but there are many real and well-documented. Voodoo, witchcraft, the bleeding statues, the ones that are, you know, the statues of Mary, you know, Virgin Mary, weeping blood, the Ouija boards, are all these things. They, it's market diversification. They're going to try to get you any way they can. I had a teenage experience with a Ouija board. It was through simple curiosity. It wasn't desperate, just thought, what's this about? There were two sessions. I had two sessions with it. The seducing spirit I found was real. It was powerful. It was malevolent. And brethren, it was scary. So I'm thankful for the lesson. I'm saying, thanks, I needed that. I never did it again. 16 later, years later, I found the truth. And I found out here's what that was really going on. Spiritism takes many forms. In modern entertainment, it promotes it. I mean, if you look at if you look at the movies that are available, oh my word, they're overwhelming. Movies, books, holidays. Uh, gee, what was yesterday? Halloween, holidays, the internet, even school lessons is promoted there. Witchcraft, Wiccan. Now this is promoted because of religious freedom, tolerance, diversity. I mean, let's get it everywhere. It can flood into your homes through TV, movies, internet. So we have to keep it out and not become desensitized to it. Now, Brother Rick Cunningham, he gave a wonderful public talk in New Albany, Louisville. It's on Christian resources called Angels and Demons in the World Today. He goes through a lot, lot more uh, detail in the various scriptures and examples. Well, Paul talked about the doctrines of devils. He says, uh, don't give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, especially in the latter times, says for, such as forbidding to marry, committing, commanding to abstain from meats, and these things which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know. Is anybody who's married isn't thankful to have your spouse for that wonderful relationship you have? They should be thankful. God ordained that. Well, why would the seducing spirits want marriage and meats to be forgiven? Meats, simply different types of foods. Well, think of the Catholic priests and their clergy. They can't marry, but they're human. They have these natural drives, these natural desires. But what, this, what the uh, fallen angels want to do is create an unsatisfied desire, a need, a craving, and then offer to satisfy those desires in sinful ways, such as fornication. There's a one a tremendous history of this in confidence and what, leading to infanticide, uh, other things, pedophilia, sodomy, all these various things, satisfying a natural human need, but in an unauthorized way. And what does it do? It alienates the person from God further and further so that they'll then look for answers and solace outside of their relationship with God, just like Saul did, just like Saul did. Make them desperate and make them think God will have nothing to do with me. Well, note that Martin Luther was a celibate, celibate priest as well. But he read the Bible, he followed it, and he later married. He realized this is not natural. It's not right. I'm going to get married. He learned the, about the doctrines of devils, you know, and he, was, he translated the New Testament in 11 weeks. <laughs> it was amazing. He learned about the doctrine of devils and what Paul advised about marriage, where he said it's better to, in 1 Corinthians 7, 9, it's better to marry than to burn with passion. You know, share, share your love, share your life, your home, your faith with your helpmate, with your partner. Well, is there hope for the fallen angels? When we talk about fallen angels, they're ones that are trying to be good, but they're ones that are still going the wrong direction. Well, the answer is yes. In 1 Peter 3 8, for Christ also, also hath suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the spirit, by which, 
also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now it didn't mean that G1, you know, he would when he was uh, after his, his uh, crucifixion, he's down in hell speech, speaking to the spirits in, cris, in prison. No, he didn't exist. He was non-existent for parts of three days. But Jesus showed through his entire uh, consecrated life that spiritual power is not to be used in a selfish way, that the temptations of Satan can be rejected, that sacrifice on the behalf of others and doing God's righteous will is the best path. Then they saw that Jesus was raised by God to the divine nature. Jesus never said, I will be ascend to the sides of the north. I will be like the most high. No, he laid his life down selflessly and God exalted him. What a lesson for these fallen angels. So pre Jesus preached this by his actions, by his example. Well, the fallen angels could reform themselves. They could pattern themselves after the holy angels. They could stand strong against the influence of the prince of devils and his followers. Jude 1.6, and the angels were kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He's reserved in everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day. The implication is that many of these chains, these restraints, would be removed at the Lord's return. How many? Don't I don't know. But this increase of freedom would then show if they have reformed for themselves or not. You know, if they have more liberty, see what they do with it. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians 6, 3, Paul says, do you know that we are to judge angels? Well, in the spirit, so this, this, uh, this time after the Lord's return, the restraints are being taken away. And it's interesting, do you know that we shall judge angels? Was he talking to the entire church? Or is he talking to those in his day who would be resurrected in, in 1878? Well, in the Spiritism pamphlet, this is in reprints 2169 through 2189. It's very long. There are also recordings of this, uh, recordings of this that you can listen to if you wish. But this, in the, this pamphlet indicates that their judgment may be in the mediatorial phase of the kingdom, where uh, Brother Russell says, under the reign of Christ and the church, the kingdom of God in exalted power. Now, he doesn't say it in, you know, this will be in the mediatorial phase, but he uses this phrase. But later in reprint uh, 4292, in an uh, article called The Judgment of, of the Fallen Angels, uh, this is, you know, about 2,000 uh, reprint pages later, says no test or trial would be possible for those demons during the millennium when, when nothing shall hurt or destroy. So there would be another restraint there. How could you have a trial of what people would actually do with liberty if they're being restrained from doing anything wrong? And reprint 4880, uh, we cannot think that God will allow this trial of the angels during the millennial reign for then Satan will be bound and all evil influences restraint. So, you know, I appreciate the logic of that, that that is really happening now. That's what's happening now. That's why we see uh, witchcraft, spiritism, uh, you know, all these things in popular entertainment. Uh, it's rife. It's rampant. I mean, to go back, if you go back to when I was a kid, would we have some of these shows on uh, that you have now? Absolutely not. So some of the big lessons that I took from this, again, this is thoughts on spiritism. The big lessons are to have confidence in God. Don't seek other answers, other, other answers, other safety, other solace. Put your faith in God. Psalm 91. Go to Psalm 91. Be watchful. Be circumspect. Be circumspect. Remember the vow. Re resist everything akin to spiritism and occultism. When we look at our protection and safety, keep in mind, Paul says to the Ephesians, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Spiritual wickedness in high places. What to do? Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Don't sit there doing nothing. Take on the whole armor of God. Arm yourself with the things that 
God has given, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having to un all, having done all to stand, stand strong. We have guardian angels. <clears throat> Don't despise any of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. So we have not only our will, which we have control over, we don't have to invite anybody in to take control. We have control over that, but we also have the guardian angels to help us in the, go in the right direction. So also, where do you live, brethren? Where do you live? Where should we live? In John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my abide, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Psalm 91, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Thy dwelling. Where do you abide? In Christ. Are you dwelling in Christ? There's no evil that's going to come there. But, brethren, we want to invite the proper spirit. There is a spirit we want to invite. Well, spirit, Ruach, Numa. That's the proper influence, not to take us over, not to destroy our identity, but the influence that's going to help change us. We want that proper spirit in our hearts. Ephesians 5.18, be ye filled with the spirit, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.16, know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. His influence, his influence, his transforming influence. Romans 8.9, <clears throat> but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Brethren, God wants us to retain our identities. He wants us to base our lives and our identity on the righteous principles and influences that are being used to transform us into the character likeness of God's dear son. Thank you. And I will stop this share. Your mic is live there, Mitchell. Okay. Thank you, Brother Harry. We really appreciate that. Uh, Brother Harry has asked for us to close with him 261A, Jesus, Refuge of My Soul. This is uh, 345 in the red, so it's the same hymn. So I will mute and start it here.
Thank you, Brother. Uh, Brother Harry, would you uh, close your service, please? Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy most holy and precious name, and hallowed be the name of thy dear Son. Dear Father, we give thee thanks that uh, through all the creation that your plan is showing that all things will work out according to your will, that it'll proper, it'll prosper in the things to which you sent it, that even the wrath of man and of angels will praise thee. <clears throat> the mankind will learn the wonderful lesson of the exceeding sinfulness of sin and learn righteousness in your kingdom fully established on earth soon. We ask if anything uh, was said or done amiss that would be revealed to us. We give you thanks for the, for the watch care and keeping and all the tools you've given for our protection and strengthening so we can stand in the evil day. We pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, and we pray thy continued blessing on our convention. Amen. Amen. Brother Harry, are you willing to take a few questions if the brethren have them for a few minutes? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Brother Michael. Brother Harry, how are you? Well, I'm good. That's an answer. That's an easy question. I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> No dogma, no, no dogma there. Yeah. I want to thank you. For, thank you for reminding us of the uh, issues about spiritism. I had, like you, a similar experience when I was in college with the Ouija board. And uh, I was about 21. And it was pretty frightening because being in the Catholic Church, it was right up my alley, you know, to be uh, mortified by something like that but uh it was later by the lord's grace that i was to find out the truth of the spirit scriptures yeah. but you did suggest a thought to me that I really uh i thought was interesting is that the fallen angels angry about losing their children put the idea into the jewish nation or some of them in the jewish nation to destroy their own children in in the infant burn uh, killings and it just was all has always appalled me but you know i can see where that would be an origin of the thought over yeah. well the uh yeah it's interesting if you look Mol up uh, molech baal tammuz you look through jeremiah and you look at all these things about molech molech you know wasn't a later development molech was talked about in leviticus you know in, in early when the law was given and Moloch didn't just pop up. This had been around for centuries and centuries and centuries. So, uh, and you're going to see that the, 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 this idea of child torture and destruction and sacrifice is linked intimately with spiritism, with the mm -hmm. work of the fallen angels. So, you know, it just that just, you know, popped out in the things that I was reading. Uh, Brother Richard, thank you. Brother Richard Stewart, it looks like you have a question. Yes, I have a question. I have, I have to put a thought in the question form uh, to satisfy Brother Ed. Uh, that it seems to me that the the uh, judgment of the of the angels, the there's an expression in that scripture with along with that scripture, that this this honoreth all the saints or some, something to that effect. So the question is, how can this be? that uh, the saints this side of the veil, the judgment has to take place before the church is complete, as you brought out. Uh, well, uh, how can this be? Yeah, some of, the, some of those references, let me see if I can, uh, yeah, let me just go to the 1 Corinthians 6, 3. Uh, hold on just a second. <laughs> where it says, uh, do, well, it says uh, he's talking to the church in Corinth. You know, Corinth had problems. They weren't taking care of their own problems within their ecclesia. And he says, do you know that, no, not that the saints shall judge the world. And if the world should be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? And uh, then he says, no, you're not that we shall judge angels. 
So, uh, you know, he doesn't specifically say the entire church will be together there to do this. But he says this is going to be one of the jobs of, uh, of the church, that we will judge angels. And it's certainly the ones he was talking to, they'd be resurrected, and I'm making the election sure they'd be resurrected in 1878. So it's one, it's, uh, the question would be, is this a, you know, a, a universal statement? Or is this statement about those who would be in glory by that time? <clears throat> but uh, Brother Russell, in his reasoning in these the two articles we talked about, the reprint 4292 and the 4880, and you can find others, where he says, uh, because in the millennium, all evil will be restrained. Nothing shall hurt or destroy. So if you're really going to give somebody a testing or a trial, they have to have some liberty to, to operate the way they want to, so that can be observed. And uh, he's essentially saying that wouldn't be able to happen in the mediatorial phase of the kingdom. So that's about the best best answer I can uh, I can give you. Uh, you know, more study may be what's necessary on that. Here's here's my my thought on that, brother Harry. Uh, I, I think there's an Old Testament scripture that has the the, the thought of all the saints. Uh, I'd have to look it up, but well, this honor thought, had all the yeah, had all the saints. Yeah. This, this my thought is is that these angels are being released when during the harvest, right? With, at the Lord's They're return, being given more freedom during the harvest. At the Lord's return. Yeah. So I think the saints this side of the veil become an object of their testing. Are they going to go along with Satan and still try to destroy and? Or are they going to say, uh -huh, hands off? This is well, God's sure. you know, yeah, that, that's the big so, test. In a sense, we participate in the judgment by being objects of their testing. Right. Well, the uh, you know, th that's one of one of the reasons why Brother Russell has so many, you know, the vow, they have so many articles, so many warnings. Uh, the in the Spiritism booklet in reprint, you know, two thousand or so. 2169 and on, he's got example after example after example after example of the angel of what they're doing. You know, one will one one will lead somebody astray and tell them all this terrible stuff, and then another angel will come and talk to so Oh, well, that was a bad angel. I'm a good angel. You know, they play the bad cop, good cop, bad cop kind of thing. And uh, but all of them were were fallen. All of them were decrepit. So it's really a matter: are they going to keep messing with mankind, or are they going to, or are they going to not? Well, so we're uh, because the the one of the main targets is the brethren. I mean, they were, we're the ones who they really want to destroy. Who Satan certainly wants to destroy. Uh, you know, the test part of the testing is because we are here. So, but I just would suggest a little more personal study on it you know i'm not pretending to have all the answers it's just sharing some thoughts you know some some things from the studies i've had uh let's see uh there's a brother zero uh, zero seven five three brother or sister on a on a phone Harry. Yes, I, um, I I do believe that we are judging angels now. I do believe we I have done it at work when individuals have gone to either seances or whatever. I have explained how this is the evil angels. Uh -huh. And I believe that when you give a talk such as you are giving, that you and those of us who agree are also judging angels. They hear what is being said. My question is this, what about one who is claiming to be consecrated, who is invis involved in spiritism and speaking to the dead? What is our responsibility as brethren to this individual? Well, uh, number one, what is your name? Sister. My name is Merrily. Merrily. Okay. Yes. Well, the responsibility what? would be clearly you're going the wrong way. This is really, you're doing this 
I'm not going to have anything to do with you. You know, the vow have nothing to do with spiritism or occultism. You know, if they're doing this, they're going directly against the ordinance of, of, of God. He's saying have absolutely nothing to do with this. You know, the seven nations we talked about destroyed them utterly, totally. Why? Because they were dressed improperly? No, it's because of their religion, their practices, the spiritism, the things they did were totally against God. And uh, so if one is going to say, yes, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm consecrated, but I'm talking to the dead, I don't think they're very consecrated. Don't they know the dead are dead? I mean, have they read Ecclesiastes 9? There's some something, there's a serious problem here. They need to be straightened out. Some elders in uh, the ecclesia or something should be doing the kind of things that uh, Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You know, let's, uh, let's help this person out. Help them out. Let them know what's right, what's wrong, and uh, take appropriate steps. Okay, Brad. Thank you. About our time, we need to. Uh, we just have a fifteen-minute break left till the next session. Okay. Well, I'm. You know, if the I, I'm happy if the brother want to talk some more about this. It's up. Brother it's up Harry, to, I had a question. I'm Sister Judy. Okay. Um, my question is, do you think that the human trafficking and child trafficking is all involved in this also? Well, there's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of very well documented things where, uh, you know, they find 100 children here or 50 children there. 